Well, welcome everybody to the uh, Flying Aces exhibit here in the uh, Georgetown Library. I'm Richard Zapp. I'll be your host uh, today. Uh, and we'll explain a little bit about the, the history and what we do with Flying Aces. Um, it's, I'm sure if you noticed when you came in, there's a bunch of airplanes hanging in the uh, atrium. Uh, all those airplanes are powered, believe it or not, by, uh, by rubber bands and uh, rubber-powered uh, model aircraft. And all of them fly. Uh, so it's not only just building these airplanes, but it's flying them. It's, it, one of the interesting things about uh, rubber band airplanes is that uh, rubber band model airplanes were flying in the 1870s well before the Wright brothers ever took off. And we have a small exhibit around the corner uh, that, uh, that shows you about uh, the individuals who uh, started uh, flying these uh, airplanes. He called them uh, planar fours. Um, and of course, now, of course, we call them uh, airplanes. But that was part of the exhibit. But um, as soon as uh, the Wright brothers were able to fly, people started building models. Uh, the obvious initial choice for models, because they didn't have engines that small enough at that time, was uh, rubber-powered airplanes. That continued through the 1920s and 1930s. Um, and a number of magazines that grew up at that time, and that was the Flying Aces magazine. There were three things in this magazine that were kind of uh, fun to, to think about. Um, one of the things was there was always stories about things that were going on, and if you were a teenage boy at the time, the covers of these magazines were just killers. They were just wonderful. They had really great stories in them. I mean, who could resist the dust bombs of death? <laughs> <laughs> or death stalks our Coast Guard skymen. I mean, with stories like that, I mean, who could go wrong? Uh, there were several different heroes in these uh, stories. Kerry Kane was the... Uh, he uh, was a, a humble millionaire who flew airplanes, and he was known as the Griffin, and he would, had a black or a red mask that he would uh, fly to disguise himself. Now at 20,000 feet, who could tell whether he had a mask on or not? Uh, it was uh, part of the history of these, uh, these things. The other uh, two things that were contained in these magazines were a uh, history of, uh, of uh, actual uh, airplanes at the time, uh, there's a lot of uh, interest in uh, World War I at the time, because they didn't have World War II, but also um, airplane, contemporary airplanes at the time. But I think for most of uh, those people interested at the time, there were plenty of plans in these, probably three or four plans in each, uh, in each issue. Um, and so this is where the Flying Aces started. Um, this was interrupted by World War II, but a lot of guys, when they came back from World War II, wanted to build uh, model airplanes again. Uh, by that time, there was a lot of uh, gas engine type airplanes and stuff, and uh, rubber airplanes, uh, rubber powered airplanes, fell out of uh, interest until the 1960s. And there were two guys in Connecticut, Dave Stott and Bob Thompson. And this was kind of a joke, kind of flying aces thing, which uh, started rubber-powered model airplanes. And for the time of the 1960s and 70s, it actually went kind of viral to the point where in the Flying Aces uh, uh, organization now, we have about uh, 2,000 uh, members uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, we've got clubs in Canada, uh, UK, and I think also in, uh, in Germany. So uh, it, it spread out uh, pretty much. Um, in terms of uh, some of the other things, uh, we do have uh, plans of airplanes, and I just wanted to point out here, we've got a plan of uh, Curtis Robin uh, here, and because we're also interested in the history of aircraft and why this airplane is important, it was, uh, this is a copy of the airplane that uh, Ronway Corrigan flew. Um, uh, Bromway Corrigan was an Irish guy. He wanted to fly back to Ireland. The FAA said, no, 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 you can't fly. That airplane is too dangerous. You'll wind up in the drink and die. Uh, so he said, okay, I won't fly to Ireland. I'll fly to the west coast of the United States. They said, fine, if you run out of gas or something, you can always land. Well, he took off one day and he, quote, had a compass error. <laughs> and he wound up in Ireland. 
and he landed there, and uh, they were very great to ha grateful to have him there. They said, you look cold, have a Jameson's and a couple of Guinness, we'll warm you right up. Uh, he came back to the United States, the FAA was furious, except the Irish uh, population in New York City threw him a ticket tape parade down Broadway, and uh, so he escaped. He never fessed up until uh, shortly before his death, I think, which was in the 1990s that he had uh, uh, actually uh, planned the whole thing. So uh, we kind of follow the history of those kinds of things. Um, the Flying Aces is also a competitive organization, um, although I should say the competition is, is a friendly kind. When we have new members, we like to get them, move them along, and help them as much as possible in terms of making the airplanes uh, fly. And we have a couple of examples of some of the airplanes we have here in the different types of classes. And we'll talk a little bit more about those as we go outside. But this is a peanut. And that's a class of airplane. Uh, you can build just about any type of airplane, but the wingspan can't exceed 13 inches. So it's for small airplanes. A lot of beginners think, oh, peanuts are small, they're easy to fly. They're not. Um, this is a one design we've chosen for this year. Um, it's actually from the Guillo Company, which is a Massachusetts uh, model company that is still in existence. Um, that company, uh, I guess, was also uh, functioning in the 1930s, and this was one of their early designs. Um, and uh, you give members the plans, and they have, can pretty much do them up in any color scheme they want. Uh, this is particular. This is mine. I figured that everybody needs a villain, so I thought I'd be the villain with the with the bad guy Martins on it here. Um, we also build very large airplanes and complex airplanes, and uh, this is a Canadian water bomber, uh, still in existence. It's called the CL215. Um, uh, the real airplane actually is very cleverly designed. It's designed for very, very low speed. Uh, the way it gets water is that it will skim across the lake. It takes 30 seconds to fill its tanks with water, and then it has doors that will open up and, and drop uh, water on uh, whatever they want to put out, usually forest fires. The interesting thing about this airplane is the Canadians built it in hopes that the US forestry would buy a couple of them. They never did. <laughs> but the Canadians bought them. This one is in Spanish colors. Was born, uh, it was a, a, a Spanish airplane. Uh, the Greeks have them, everybody else has them, but in the United States we don't. Too bad, it's a really great airplane. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this fellow here. He is one of the guys that's kind of the, uh, the mascot of the, the, the Flying Aces, uh, Phineas Pinkham. He appeared in many of the stories that were in these Flying Aces magazines. Uh, uh, he was kind of a doofy kind of guy uh, that uh, was always getting in trouble with his superiors and always getting in trouble with the, the Germans and uh, uh, in, in every episode it was pretty predictable he would get himself in hot water but in the end he would always wind up uh, solving the problem and so the brass couldn't punish him and uh, all the Germans were in jail. Nobody ever got killed in World War I according to these stories. They just got captured uh, and, and so on. So. Um, any questions at this point, or we can move outside and I'll... I'll uh, where, where is the power on that water bomb? In the nacelles? Yes. It's, it's right in here. These are radial engines. They were probably... No, I mean, for your rubber power. Oh, yeah. Right wow. there. And we'll show you upstairs. You can put an awful lot of rubber in a small space if you know how to do it and um, we know how to do it and we can show you how to do it, uh, <laughs> basically. So um, that's that. We do have uh, one class of uh, airplane. Uh, this is the very light. We fly them primarily indoors. The reason for this particular aircraft um, was in initially that if you're going to build a, a big airplane, maybe you should start off with something small and something that you could build up very quickly. Uh, and so, as you can see, this airplane really has no fuselage to it and so on. Um, the, the, the name for them is no cal, as in no calories. <laughs> um, but with a little bit of luck, maybe we can do a little flight demonstration here and get this thing to uh, fly um, around the, uh, 
uh, around the room here. That's why we cleared out all the chairs here. Um, uh, this is called the Turbo Stallion. Believe it or not, it's a the real one is a kit airplane. You know, you can uh, build this yourself. All you need is about, you know, I'd say fifty thousand dollars for the kit, and then another hundred thousand dollars for the turbo uh, turbo engine. So, for one hundred fifty thousand dollars, you get yourself some reliable transportation, hopefully. And the life insurance policy costs. You know, the interesting <laughs> thing is about kit airplanes. The real kit airplanes, they're as safe as. Um, regular manufactured airplanes from uh, Cessna or some of the other manufacturers except for the first 10 hours. So you need to get a test pilot the first 10 hours and uh, uh, if somebody has a new kit plane and wants to take you for a ride, make sure it's got at least uh, 10 hours of flight time on it or else you're risking life in limb. So we'll just uh, do a quick uh, flight, see how this thing winds. If it uh, wanders over to you, don't worry, it will just bounce off um, and it, it will do more damage to itself than it will, will, uh, will to you. Um, I think that this is probably enough winds in here. Hey Rich, how, how long do those models typically fly? Oh, how long do they fly? Um, we aim for two minutes, which is called a max. Indoors, it's very difficult to do that, but there are some people who can get very thin ones like this to fly for, for two minutes. Um, outdoors, um, we can get them to fly for over two minutes, and sometimes they fly a lot longer than that. And I think a number of us who have been in the flying aces for any time have lost, lost some. Um, uh, Two years ago, I had an airplane, and uh, it uh, circled over the field for 24 minutes before it got caught into the upper winds and went towards Route 95 or something like that. Uh, at any rate, we'll see how this flies. Okay, I'm, I'm not guaranteeing anything here, but we'll we'll see how it goes. Oh, oh. Whoa. Yeah, well, over Matt wound it, but I think you have the idea. Yeah. Um, just for some of you, I have a little cartoon here who I, that I can hand around and kind of give you an idea of most of the people who were involved in the Flying Aces. We've got a little kid here, he's flying a paper airplane. And as it flies around, suddenly it sprouts landing gear and the uh, aircraft carrier and it lands on the aircraft carrier. And his teacher says, I said, no more paper airplanes. And he looks up and says, I thought you said, no more mere paper airplanes. <laughs> so you can uh, pass that around. Um, what we'll do now is we'll go outside and uh, into the atrium there and we can uh, point out some of the airplanes. And, uh, a little bit about the history of those as well as the FAC. And then you have an airplane called the Goon, and you can see it's a very slender, this is a very, very small airplane. And you have one of my favorites here, which is the GBZ. This airplane won the Thompson race in 1931. The Thompson race uh, was basically the NASCAR race, the, the Daytona 500 of its day. It got a lot of ink. In from people and so on. Uh, and this airplane uh, was built in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, as I said, it, it just beat the pants off of everybody in the 1931 Thompson race. So they did the only sensible thing. They took the engine out of it and put a 750 horsepower engine in it. The original engine was about 400 horsepower. And they decided that they would try and set an all-time speed record with the, the airplane. That didn't work out too well because um, uh, it, uh, they think it developed uh, high speed vibrations which caused the, 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 the wing to fail on the airplane and, and the pilot Walt Davis was, uh, was killed and they actually had to film of it which is, which is pretty disturbing and ugly, uh, particularly for a pilot. I just want to talk about this airplane over here. This is uh, TBF. Uh, it was a torpedo bomber and a general bomber in the 
in the Navy during World War II. It's called the Bush Bomber. Anybody know why? Well, I'm going to tell you then. George Bush Sr. flew this airplane. He was the youngest naval aviator in World War II uh, in the United States Navy. He was shot down over Chichi Jima, which is uh, near Iwo Jima, another island right next to it. Uh, and they actually have a video of the time of, uh, when he was picked up by a submarine and kind of dragged out of the ocean like a brown rat. So uh, just has an interesting, uh, interesting history to it. Uh, this fellow over here is the um, belong or is a model of an airplane uh, called the Walker DR-1. It's a triplane and uh, this is the airplane that uh, uh, Baron von Richthofen flew. The last one that he flew, he was uh, killed in this airplane. He shot down actually by ground fire. Uh, some people say he was shot down by Roy Brown, who was flying a, uh, uh, a British airplane at the time, but I think the facts point out that he was shot down by, uh, by ground fire. It's not all Snoopy. red. Not Snoopy, Richard? What? And not, not Snoopy. Snoopy. You get shot down, but Snoopy gets shot down by him a lot. I'm just reading. That's for sure. Uh, the interesting thing is, is that uh, um, von Richthofen was not only a uh, an accomplished fighter pilot, but he was a very, very good leader. And the fact that this airplane was all red, part of the reason was, of course, hubris on the side of, aha, I'm good, you can't get me. Uh, but the other part of it was so that the other people of his squadron could see him. Uh, and within his squadron, which was called the Flying Circus, a lot of the airplanes were very black, brightly colored. And this was basically so that he could tell who they were so that you could, uh, uh, you know, have kind of uh, after action reports and, and make adjustments in, in their ability to fly because uh, at the time there weren't any radios in, in the airplane. So um, that kind of sums up uh, the history of uh, von Richthofen. Um, we have some airplanes, remember I said there were one designs. This is a one design yes, we had so uh, a few years ago. You'll probably you know, one of our guys, and this over here, remember I said there are, are were stories in the FAC magazine, well, uh, this is the Talus Wonder, uh, you can tell by the, the, the crossbones on the side that in, uh, it's a model of one of, the, one of the stories of one of the bad guys with the skull and crossbones, and we do have uh, what we call a fantasy flyer. Uh, class where you, you can build models that weren't part of the, uh, uh, weren't necessarily real airplanes, but were part of the uh, the, the, the stories that, you know, that were written at the time. So uh, the, the one I always want to do is, have you seen the film Chicken Run? Yes. Chicken I, I want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's certainly a reasonable kind of thing on the flying chicken coop. I think that would be a, uh, a, a, a great idea. Um, so, um, again, this is a P-40 over here. I don't know whether you noticed, but in uh, the other room I failed to mention it is that uh, there is a, a partial the, oh, the construction of the airplane that's hanging up there. This would be the completed construction of what the airplane looked like. Uh, it was uh, one of the fighters that we had during the early part of uh, World War II. Uh, it had its strengths and it had its weaknesses. It, uh, it had a very low ceiling, which meant it couldn't fly very high. Um, and it wasn't all that maneuverable, but it had a lot of guns and it could take a lot of punishment and it could dive like crazy. So, uh, you know, it, it had its advantages and it did hold the line until more accomplished airplanes like this one over here, the P 51 Mustang, came along, which was perhaps the best propeller driven airplane of, uh, of World War II. Um, of course, the Germans would argue that the Messerschmitt Army 105 was the greatest, and the Brits will tell you it was the Spitfire. But we're all Americans here, so that's the, that's the, that's the best one. So, any questions about these other airplanes here? Just uh, how long does it take uh, to build an average airplane? It, it depends on how obsessive you are, you know. Uh, we have some members of our, our, our club, uh, 
fellow by the name of Van Spielberg, he's an accomplished folk singer. He goes like one airplane a year. They're very, very complex and so on. Um, I'm retired and it still takes me about uh, six weeks to two months to build one. You know, working on a couple hours in the evening and so on. So it, it depends on the complexity of the uh, airplane. So that water bomber I had built it many, many uh, years ago, it took me all over the building on the airplane. Uh, but it'd be a lot less for a beginner for a simple Yeah, the simple airplanes, these, these kinds of things, the, 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 the no cow that I flew in there, that, that airplane will fly, uh, you could build that in an evening or two. Um, and uh, there's some airplanes, this is a dime scale. Um, that's because back in the 1940s, you could buy a kit for an airplane like this for a dime. They generally had a wingspan of about 16 inches and so on. Those airplanes can be built up and so on. Uh, so it depends upon your motivation, how obsessive you are about the detail. And that sort of thing. So, yeah, are they expensive to all? Um, actually, not. If you scratch build, it doesn't cost probably anything to build these airplanes. If you um, uh, buy a, a kit, they range probably some, uh, somewhere between uh, 20 and uh, up, with, up to $100. But I think most people kind of build a 20 or $30 kind of uh, airplane. The interesting thing about this dime scale airplane now, Remember, it's only in the 1940s. It was uh, it was 10 cents when I was a kid. It was 29 cents. Now it's like 20 bucks. <laughs> you know, for the same kid. So there, there there is the issue of that uh, that uh, sort of thing. If you want, we'll go upstairs and I'll show you some of the other uh, some of the other aircraft and uh, we'll put those out. Big race. And that airplane in a slightly different color was won by Jackie Cochran, the girl. As a matter of fact, there were nine Bendix races, and three of them were won by women. Think about that. There you go. If you remember, I said that uh, the rubber-powered airplane started in the 1870s, and this was with Alphonse Pinot. And here, if you want to read a little bit about uh, his history and so on, this is the plane of four, which is the airplane that he built. And, uh, this is a picture of, unfortunately, he was crippled. Um, and the, the tragedy is, is that I think he was in so much pain in later parts of his life that he suicided. But he was quite a contributor. He was way ahead of his time in terms of aeronautics and so on. And uh, was a real contributor to, uh, to the rights, although I don't think they ever met. Now here we have the giants to the this is a, a peanut airplane, again, 13 inches. We have a class for giant scale airplanes. And uh, my friend Jack Cation built this. You can see this is a, a Waco biplane in the 1930s. It's really big. I've seen, some of our club members have seen this fly. It's really quite spectacular when you see it in the air. It, it looks like a real airplane. Um, over here, we have the Sehabich, which means hawk in German. And uh, during the 1920s, uh, power gliders like this were all the rage uh, in, uh, in, in Germany. Uh, it was during that time also that they were using to uh, uh, build up uh, a number of pilots for the Luftwaffe, which uh, somewhat infamous during World War II. Um, so uh, we have some uh, static airplanes down there that were the if you want later on, you can look at the, those. The big silver one on the left-hand side, that is a Junkers J, uh, JU-52. Uh, it was an airliner during World War, uh, before World War II. Uh, during, World, during the Spanish Civil War, the Germans used it as a bomber. And it's one of the airplanes that bombed Guernica. Uh, and uh, then it was used as a freighter pretty much throughout the war. And, um, that type of airplane survived uh, mostly in South America as, as freighters to our time, basically, until the 1990s. So, uh, Wasn't Newt Rockney killed in one of those? Who? Newt Rockney? Uh, he may have. It was either that or a Ford Trimotor. No, it was, it was a Junkers. It, it may well have been. I'm yeah. not sure about that, but it, uh, it, it's certainly a possibility. Uh, we have a little. Uh, 
area over here which shows you how we build airplanes. And if you come over here, we'll do a little description of that. Believe it or not, this is our signature airplane uh, that we use to fly indoors. And uh, the 25th of this month, uh, we will be having a contest at, uh, at Pembroke. Everybody's welcome to come and, and, and see what's happened. Bring the kids if, if you so desire. Uh, this airplane has a very manly name. It's called the Pussycat. <laughs> um, and it was designed uh, by uh, Al Backstrom. And he did a very clever thing. Uh, he put all the directions on how to build it exactly on the plan. And if you build it exactly as he has done, you wind up with something that looks like these. And you can see the stations where you lay the plans out. And you kind of construct things where you're building the fuselage. And then over here, we have some colored things. And then we have two completed the pussycats. They fly very well. And uh, we have something called a mass launch contest where there are two of them. <laughs> and the interesting thing is the person that uh, she beat is, I, I won't mention Ray Harlan by name, but uh, he is a, uh, uh, a, he's now retired, but he was a, a professor of aerodynamics at MIT. And uh, is quite a leader in terms of uh, building uh, model airplanes and so on. He set several national records with uh, with, with my airplane, so he was beaten by a 12-year-old girl. <laughs> so you ladies, there, the girls can do it. Tell them about the in New, York. in New York. What? I will. Oh, okay. That's, okay. That's in the works. Uh, yeah, we also, uh, there is also a national contest. I'll get to that later. We, we uh, have a contest at Geneseo, uh, New York, every year, in which uh, people from the West Coast and from England and Canada and so on come. Uh, it's a, it's a, quite a quite a get together, um, and um, we we fly just about every type of airplane there that you can uh, imagine. Um, in these magazines, you also see the, the present Flying Aces magazine that we have. It comes out two uh, six times a year. Uh, it costs fifteen bucks. Along with that, you become a member of the Flying Aces or FAC. Uh, there are also a few plaques in here, and those plaques were, were, were from, uh, uh, from the, uh, the contest at Geneseo, the national contest, which is run every other year, but it's actually run every year because the interim year is called the non-nats. But the same people show up, uh, and it's, 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 uh, it's just as much fun. I, I would say it's, it can be quite competitive there, but it's also... Uh, if you choose to be kind of laid back and just enjoy yourself. Well, you Richard, do where do you get the, where do you, if I can ask, where do you get the, uh, the materials to build that model with? Um, you know, that's can I, becoming... Can I get it at Michael's? Well, can I go to Michael's? Or yeah, store I think like there, that? If, if you show up at our contest, we'll give you the materials mm -hmm. and the plans. Uh, but, um, you know, with the death of most hobby shops, that's becoming a problem. But uh, probably Hobby Lobby, you can get uh, balsa wood. Rich, Peel Craftsman down in Newburyport is carrying the Willow line now. Oh, okay. great! And he's so. got he's got boxes of wood uh, balsa. Wow. Excellent. Oh, this is where Peel Craftsman. All Where's right. That? Two and a half Center Street, Newburyport. Right. Wow. Oh, three and a half. That's cool. <laughs> three and a half. Um, yeah. At any rate. I want to move on to this airplane here because it's one of my favorites. That's okay. Uh, this is a racing plane in the 1930s. It was flown by a guy by the name of Roscoe and Race, which was like in the 1930s. Um, he's the only guy to win it three times. And, uh, this airplane is the one in which he won the last two times in 1938 and 1939. The reason that I mention Roscoe is that he was quite a character. He owned a pet lion. <laughs> Um, which he took around with him. And uh, uh, there are two rather interesting stories about Roscoe and the lion, which was called Gilmore. Uh, one of them was uh, that he took him to a restaurant one day, and uh, the, the, the lion wasn't interested in the cuisine. What he was interested in was the women's shoes. <laughs> and he ate. Why he, it must have been some kind of hormonal thing that the lion sniffed out, but he, but he chewed up nearly all the shoes, uh, the women's shoes in the restaurant slightly bigger than this one, and uh, uh, they decided that they were going to uh, uh, repossess his airplane. Well, Gilmore jumped out 
first. And uh, they gave up any thought of uh, me possessing the airplane. <laughs> so, so that's the history of that. So we'll move into here and we'll, we'll show you some. It was an uh, observation airplane for the, for the Nazis during World War II. And you can see it's got the weirdest configuration ever. It's got the tail is like offsider on one side and the observation area is here and the motor is on another stick over here. And you never think that that thing would fly. It flies beautiful as a model and it flew very well as a, uh, as, a uh, uh, as an actual airplane. The interesting thing is, is that uh, we as human beings like symmetry actually with the propeller swirl and the torque of the engines and what they call geometric, ge geometric precession that is created by a propeller airplane, this is probably a better configuration than a, a nicely uh, a balanced airplane that's symmetrical on both sides. Um, this airplane over here is an SC-5. It, it, this was probably one of the nemesis airplanes of uh, Baron von Richthofen down there. Um, it was a British airplane. Uh, uh, it was very good because it was heavily armed and unlike a lot of the airplanes of that era, it was easy to fly. And you have to remember that uh, the, the, the people that were flying these airplanes were somewhere between 17 and 22 years of age. Most of them by the time they got to the front didn't have uh, very much experience. As a matter of fact, if you were an English uh, uh, pilot, your chances of getting past uh, the first two weeks of air combat were not very good. As a matter of fact, getting through the first day would be a miracle. If you got through the first two weeks, you might actually be useful as a pilot. But up until that point, uh, uh, up until that point, uh, you were pretty well uh, useless and inexperienced. Uh, over here, the wingspan on that airplane is only 13 feet. So. I have to wonder how it's really holding up the airplane at, the, at that, uh, that point. It's called the WLH-1. Um, this was an early, one of the early Goodyear races. Um, some of the more modern, modern ones are a little bit sleeker, but uh, uh, not so. I want to point out here is a relatively um, simple airplane. It's called the Phantom Flash. This is one of those airplanes that you can build in an evening or so. Um, it's not all that easy to trim, believe it or not. But um, once you get it going, these airplanes uh, indoors can fly well over two minutes, just inside a gym like that. So the reason I mention that is this is its big brother, the Phantom Fury, right here. And if you look at it, you can see the wings are similar and the tail is similar. Uh, these are uh, duration airplanes. This one outside uh, was flying at the Geneseo uh, in New York. Uh, and I was happy to get it back because it landed about a mile from where I launched it and it was up there for about six to eight minutes, something like that. So uh, if they get caught in an upward current, uh, which we call a thermal, they can fly for a long time. Um, I just want to conclude if we can come around this. Uh, Area. Uh, just interesting about the history of that airplane, uh, it was captured and recaptured and, and flew on both the, the, the nationalists and the uh, uh, on the fascist side uh, a couple of times. It kept getting switching sides because uh, it kept getting captured. But uh, for the interest as a model, you can see how long the rubber band is that when we have a winder um, and uh, which speeds up the winding of an airplane, a, a motor. That one is a 16 to one winder. Some of us have winders that are 20 to one, um, <coughs> 10 to one, depending upon the size of the airplane. Uh, but you can see in the back, it's attached by a, a wooden thing which holds the airplane, which is usually bolted to a table. Uh, and that's called a stooge. And we can stretch the motor out. We usually stretch it out to two or three times the length of the actual rubber band and then begin to wind. An airplane like this, we can put over 2,000 winds in the airplane. So, um, uh, uh, 
and, mm -hmm. and if you wonder how we get to the rubber in there, if you look at number four over there, there's a stick and it's kind of got a fork on the end. We put the rubber band in there, it's called the stuffing stick, so we can put it, push it all the way down and then push an aluminum tube through uh, to hold uh, the rubber. Uh, again, here are some Flying Aces magazines and a few plaques to give you an idea of uh, what things are like. Um, this is a, uh, again, another no-cal. Uh, I don't like that no-cal because it's lighter than mine and flies better. <laughs> it is not mine. Um, here, this, I will mention this airplane, it's a Cessna 180. Um, this is in the colors of, a, of an Alaska bush plane. You can see it's brightly colored, it's white and red and so on. So in case you crash, you'll, uh, you'll uh, you know, you might, they might actually find you. Um, you know, Canada has the most, not Canada, but uh, Alaska has uh, some of the most uh, general aviation pilots and thanks to the weather up there, they die like flies. Um, unfortunately, because of the weather. But I mention this airplane because it was designed by a fellow uh, by the name of Mike Nassis. Uh, there's also another club in southern Massachusetts called the uh, uh, Bay State Squadron, uh, and he designs these airplanes. Uh, he also has a, a, a little magazine called uh, a Tailspin. Uh, I have a copy of it downstairs if you want to take a look at it. Uh, and again, it comes out about every two months. Uh, and there are plans in there and so on. Uh, uh, this aircraft over here is a, a P-39. Um, it was an airplane World War II. It's in Russian colors, even though it's an American airplane. It was a Lend-Lease airplane. The Americans didn't much like this airplane because um, Initially, when it was designed, it had a supercharger on it, and then the, the powers that be in Washington, you know, it's always dangerous when you have something that's designed by a committee. Um, and so they took Larry Bell's perfectly good P-39, and they removed the supercharger, and uh, detuned the engine, and it caused a bunch of things that increased more drag, so the airplane became a real dog, uh, particularly at high altitudes. And, uh, it was shot down in droves by the Japanese uh, Zero during the beginning of World War II. But the Russians loved this airplane because it had a cannon in the nose, a 37 millimeter cannon, which is, you know, like about that big. And they used it for destroying tanks. And the other reason they, they liked it so much is, is that, unlike so many Russian aircraft, this one had a radio so that it could communicate. So communication in a big gun helped that one. Uh, one of my colleagues here, Tom, do you want to talk about this airplane at all? <clears throat> I can say a few quick words. So that, that, is a, uh, that is the first Curtis flying boat. Um, that was built in Hammondsport, New York. I don't know if any of you know the name of Curtis, but at around the time of the Wright brothers, um, Glenn Curtis started designing airplanes. He was a motorcycle manufacturer, started designing airplanes right after the Wrights first flew. And he went, actually he went further than they did because you see the little pieces hanging out on the tips of the wings? Those are called ailerons, which we all know. You know, all airplanes today have ailerons. But Glenn Curtis invent, invented that. So that is a model. It's a scale model. It's a, called a twin. It's got two motors. and. Uh, it's flown, it's a little delicate, so it's probably the best place for it to be is in a case right now. <laughs> but that's the first Curtis flying boat. Um. We have any other questions at this point? Yes? How many models have you built and how long have you been doing this? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, God. <laughs> well, before this, I built 15 boats. Two race cars. Uh, Not models, real. <laughs> real ones. Real ones. Okay. Uh, but, um, well, let me put it this way I had gigantic glue glands that uh, the, the, when my glands start to throb, I have to build something. I, I really have <laughs> lost track of about how many that I've uh, uh, that I built. The problem is, as you get better, better and better at flying them, is that they stay around. 
when you first start, it's not so bad because you take them out to the field and they wind up in a tree and they crash and you just go build another one. But after a while, you start to accumulate them and that's... that's uh, that was going to be my question. How many have survived? <laughs> well, the better you get, the better they survive. But uh, I'll tell you just a little story. I was... Uh, the, the Nancy, my wife here, she was having the oil burner man come and look at the... Uh, do the oil burner and uh, the apprentice came up and said, gee, your husband likes airplanes. And Nancy said, well, yes, you know, he's a general aviation pilot and he uh, kind of likes airplanes. And this fellow said, no, 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 I've seen them downstairs. He really likes airplanes. <laughs> and we have is, a very small basement. <laughs> which very, is, very small. Which is, which is true. There's, uh, there's probably a bazillion of them uh, down there. Although, yeah, thankfully, uh, many of these airplanes are also uh, uh, been built by uh, by other members of the Flying Aces. So uh, we've got the members of the Flying Aces here. If you have uh, any questions, you can talk to me or you can talk to any of the guys and they'll, they'll help you out. To so just repeat, uh, on the 25th of April, the 25th of uh, March, and the, I'm sorry, the 25th of okay. February, then 25th of March, and then the, the 22nd of April, we will be having uh, uh, a contest up at, uh, at Pennybrook School. You're all welcome to come. Just bring soft shoes and wipe your feet because they don't like to track and dirt all over them. Brand new gym. All over them, yeah. brand new uh, gym. Uh, but other than that. Oh, you might want to mention uh, there's a website for. And there is a website. There are two websites. If you Google Flying Aces Club, it'll come right up. That's the national organization. And uh, we have this Stealth Squadron. If you Google Stealth Squadron FAC 49, It'll come up and uh, it will list uh, the, the, the kinds of goings on. Uh, we also uh, meet in Methuen uh, on the first Wednesday of every month. And if you, you'd like to attend those meetings, you can talk to me and I can either give you directions or if you live in Georgetown, you can certainly uh, drive over with uh, me. Um, it's rather interesting going to that meeting because uh, that used to be the site of Golden Age reproduction models. There are over 250 different plans of model airplanes, and the plans are about the size of the ones here. As a matter of fact, this P-39 is one of the, of the plans. Um, and uh, if you're interested in, uh, in airplanes at all, it's a real overwhelming shocker to, to see all that stuff. And it's in the guy's basement. What? In the basement. It's in his in basement. basement. He really likes airplanes, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, anyway, I think that concludes it, unless uh, we got, a, got anything else. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank, thank you very much. Very good. Very good.